We're going to kick off here. Over the next several weeks, we will be studying this guy, Peter. Peter, the disciple Peter. Uh, He's one of the most fully formed characters that we have in the Gospels. I mean, other than Jesus, he is the most fully developed and understood. We get, you know, stories about him. We get interactions with him. We get descriptions of his emotional state. We can kind of really get to understand this guy. And so we're going to get to study him a bit over the next several weeks. I feel like um, he's a very relatable guy, and I feel like looking at his story and looking at his life is going to help me a lot, so it's very selfish. Uh, I feel like I need the encouragement that Peter's can um, go somewhere and do good things in the kingdom, and I also think it's a great picture for where we're at as a church, uh, that God wants to use uh, everyday, average, ordinary people and that can sound kind of like a consolation prize. Well, yeah, you're kind of plain Jane. You're, you know, you're kind of just an average person, but God can use you anyway. But actually just being an ordinary person is what makes us quite extraordinary. Being comfortable in our own skin to just say, hey, here I am, the good and bad, the ugly, that can seem like, well, gosh, I mean, you're just kind of an ordinary person. But actually being able to be so is quite extraordinary because the rest of the world is putting on facades and acting like they're something that they're not. And so being ordinary is actually one of the most beautiful and powerful uh, gifts and experiences that you and I can have. We don't, none of us actually are extraordinary and what burdens us is the thought that we ought to be. It's quite a laborious burden to carry. Jesus wants to set us free and help us to understand, no, I didn't really make any of my kids to be super special beyond the others. They're all special because I made them. (laughs) And what makes you most special is that I love you, and anything that you want to be extraordinary beyond that is really straight from the pit of hell, and it's trying to kill you and steal your life, not add to it. So let's look at this very ordinary guy, Peter. Before we dive into the specifics of life, I want to kind of look at this passage that's actually from Paul, but I think it's kind of a great overview of a, kind of a theme verse for this study. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Paul writes to the church in Corinth who is getting a little head, a little heady. You know, they think they're really hot stuff, and he's wanting to help them with that. And he's saying, hey, remember, guys, remember, consider your calling, brethren, that you, there weren't many wise. Uh, there were not many uh, wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish. It's kind of a backhanded compliment, isn't it? God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world uh, to shame uh, the things that are strong, which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. And then continuing in verse 29, so that no man may boast before God. His goal is not to get us to grovel and squirm in some kind of self-loathing. It's not like, oh, I'm such a, I'm so foolish, I'm so weak, I'm so miserable, I am so have nothing to offer. No, it's not that he wants us. God gets no glory out of our groveling. But he does want to set us free. Like Jesus said, you'll know the truth and it will set you free. This is not trying to get us to admit how pathetic we are. This is just to help us live in the great freedom and joy of humility, to understand that without him, we really have nothing to offer. As Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's not an insult. That's actually an invitation into freedom for us to understand, oh, the reason my life feels meaningless outside God is because it is meaningless outside God. (laughs) You know, the reason so much of my life feels like I'm spinning my wheels when I'm not connected with God is because, well, without God, I actually am spinning my wheels. You know, this is actually a message of great, incredible, powerful hope and an invitation into that which is life indeed. Understanding that in him there is real life and outside of him there isn't. That's just real true humility and the beginning of, uh, of real true life and joy. I love this passage these verses that we've just written, it's really written for me. 
It's written for you. It's written for every person who has that very real feeling of just, I don't measure up. (laughs) Uh, I'm not cutting it. What is my life amounting to? Am I really making a difference? Uh, Does anything really matter? I mean, this sounds really depressed. Uh, And maybe you struggle like I do. I mean, there are times where I just feel like, what in the world? Uh, And then I remember, oh yeah, Jesus, he's in the world and he makes a difference. And as I set my eyes on him, there's always reason for hope. And when I set my eyes on myself, there's always reason for depression. So there's a real good recipe for life. Take my eyes off myself and set my eyes on Jesus. As I'm looking at myself, I'm going to get depressed. As I look to him, I'm going to find hope. That's what these verses are about. He is, again, not trying to say beat yourself up. He's not saying wallow. He's not saying grovel. He's saying there's hope for you beyond the reality of your condition. And actually, God, the, the, the reality that you feel this way sometimes is actually what qualifies you as a candidate for God to use you. Because the people who think they have their act together, the people who are convinced by the facades that they put on, God just says, I can't confirm that. They think they're amazing, and I can't do anything to confirm that because if I do anything to make breakthroughs happen in their life, you know who they're going to think did it? Them. And I cannot get on board with that self-deception because it leads straight to the pit of hell. And I want to be with my kids for all eternity. And every point of breakthrough of heaven coming into this earth comes as we come to points of humility and saying, God, I can't get heaven into this world. I, for myself, personally need a Savior in the places of brokenness in my own life. And Jesus, if your life is to be made manifest in this world, if your resurrection, if power, if your redemption is going to advance in this world, it can't be because of how smart and how wise and how strong and how gifted I am. Every time I try to do it on my own, it backfires. I see that now. I can produce momentary results that can get some applause, but in the long run, it goes sour. So Jesus, please forgive me for my pride. I repent before you, God, for the thought that I ever could have done anything on my own. God, I come before you humbly and I recognize it's only by your grace. If anything good is going to come out of my life, it's because you're going to do a miracle. And God's like, oh, now we're cooking with gas. Now we can go somewhere. There's some fuel in this tank. It's me. It's my power. It's my spirit. And I want to do some great things. So that's what I'm getting out of this passage. And that's what I believe God wants to speak to every single one of us. Every single one of us, if we're honest, struggles with these feelings of, do I have anything to offer? And God has a real mixed answer to that. Yes and no. But let's start with no, because that's where you're confused. No, you don't have anything to offer. The only thing you have to offer is your willingness to be humbled and then used. And I've given you some gifts, but actually it's easier for me to use your weaknesses than your strengths. So let's get this straight. Let me start with your weaknesses and I'll redeem your strengths, but we'll get there. Let's start with humility. And we'll go from there. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. This is the story that we're going to read in Peter over these next, in this life of Peter over these next few, uh, over, over these next uh, few weeks. But before we even dive into the specifics of the life of Peter, let's talk about Jesus coming into the world because it really starts with him being born as a baby uh, in a manger uh, in. Bethlehem. I mean, he's not in Jerusalem. He's not born into a palace. I mean, he's coming as the king of the world. He created the whole place, and he's coming to redeem and restore the world. And, you know, if he went to any uh, strategist, you know, okay, you know, I'm planning to take over the world and, you know, uh, bring life and a message of hope, you know, let's get a marketing guy, let's get a strategist, let's get a, a campaign of, you know, whatever. Uh, This would not be your winning campaign. Be born as an infant helpless in a manger in the backwater nowheresville and grow up 
with no recognition, with no education, with no uh, position of influence, with no pedigree uh, that anyone is aware of. Actually, there was a prophetic pedigree that actually did play in, but no one actually knew that that was his pedigree until after the fact. Uh, and also hang out with a bunch of nobodies who also have no background, no influence, no uh, training, no education. And, you know, spend a few years with them, end up being betrayed by them, uh, get crucified, uh, being rejected by everyone. Uh, there you go. That's not a winning strategy uh, for, for a life of influence, and yet that's what Jesus chose. Again, that's the pattern that we just read, is he loves to take that which is despised. That's God's choice. No offense. He chooses you. He chooses you not in the places you feel like you have your act together. That's the places he's like, well, we can work with that. I can eventually humble them in that place. (laughs) But I choose you because you need help. (laughs) I choose you where you think you have nothing to offer. I'm going to give you something. And then you're going to know that I used you. So he chooses Peter. A very ordinary guy. So let's look at the first interaction that he has with Peter. It's in the book of John. Chapter 1. Hey, good place to start. Uh, But we'll skip down to verse 35. So this is right after John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. John chapter 1, starting in verse 35, it says, The next day John, he's referencing John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus and he, as he walked, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And uh, the two disciples uh, who were with him heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, uh, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Okay, so let's go back through this little passage, their first interaction here, and look at some of the details, starting back in verse 35. So John the Baptist had just baptized Jesus earlier in verse 33. It describes, because John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins, they'd grown up together presumably, but John the Baptist describes how he hadn't ever recognized that Jesus was the Messiah until that day of his baptize, because God had told him, hey, one of the people you're going to baptize is going to have a dove descend on him, and guess what? The one with the dove is the Messiah. And so sure enough, he baptizes Jesus out of the water and the dove comes down. And that's when John the Baptist, verse 33 uh, uh, earlier says, and I recognize that he was the one. So now it's the next day. And uh, John the Baptist has had a rocking ministry. I mean, just thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people have traversed across the wilderness out into the desert where John the Baptist was uh, baptizing people. And they were publicly confessing their sins and all this sort of thing. And so John the Baptist has developed a little following of disciples who are helping him dunk people and hand out towels and that sort of thing, and making sure that no one, none of the gossip columns there were, were writing down people's sins. Uh, I don't know exactly what their ministry was, but his disciples were helping him out. And uh, so that next day, he's, John is walking along with two of his disciples, and John the Baptist sees Jesus, and he says, hey, you guys, that guy, that's the real deal. That's the Messiah. He's essentially saying, I'm not really anybody. As he says in one place, I must decrease that he might increase. And I just find that to be so inspiring that John the Baptist said to his disciples, hey, that guy's the real guy. 
essentially he's saying, go follow him. And so they're like, well, it's been good knowing you, John. It's really great, cool times. Thanks, off we go. And so they go and they start following Jesus. Now, Jesus then uh, notices that they're following him and he turns around and he says, uh, interesting little detail here when it says that he saw them following. I looked up the Greek there because I was interested because uh, it uses, he sees Peter later, and he sees these guys. And I was just curious, what were the words? And, and, and surprise, surprise, the Greek words that are used in both these cases are not the standard words that have to do with just eyesight. The word here that's used for he saw these guys, it's a word that's used primarily when people would see a celebrity. You know, if you, if you go out celebrity spotting, I saw so-and-so. It has to do with insight. It has to do with honor. It says he saw them, but it's this kind of he noticed them in a special way. So he saw them following him. He turns around. He says, what do you seek? What an interesting question. What a penetrating question. He's basically saying, why are you following me? But he's asking it in a way that's far more penetrating than that. What do you seek? It's a great question question to allow Jesus to ask you on a regular basis. What do you want? What are you after? I don't know to what degree they contemplated, but it's one you can spend some time wrestling with. What do you seek? Sometimes when I feel the Lord asking me that question, I feel like I have an answer. Uh, oftentimes as I've journaled and I've gone back and read my journals, I've realized that what I thought I wanted had nothing to do with what I actually wanted. (laughs) You know, God, I'm struggling with my financial scenario and what I'm really struggling with is fear. You know, what I want is peace. What I think I want is money, but what I actually want is peace. You know, what I think I want and what I actually want uh, sometimes can be very different things. Other times uh, I feel like I have no idea what I want. (laughs) I'm just freaking out. (laughs) And that can be an absolutely okay answer to give to Jesus as well. I have no idea what I want. I just know that you have it. (laughs) So can we hang out and you help me discover what I want? But in any event, it can be a great beginning of a conversation to allow Jesus to ask you, what do you want? What are you really after? Why the struggle? Why the angst? What is it that you want that you don't have? I've given you your, a lot of things. <laughs> what don't you have? And sometimes even understanding what I don't have that I want can help me understand why I'm following Jesus. In any event, what the guys say is they say, we want to know where you're going. We want to know where, you, where are you staying, Jesus? Where are you, where are you hanging out? We've heard you're this like, kind of big-time guy. We're pretty inspired, but we want to see the real deal. Like, where are you hanging? Where are you chilling? Can we see where you set up shop? I don't know that they even have the boldness to say. They didn't actually say, can we come see it? They just said, we'd like to see it. And Jesus says, well, come on. Let's do it. Let's go hang out. Come follow me. Come come with me. And so it says that it's about 10 a.m. So this is not just a a coffee appointment. He's like saying, come on, let's hang for the day. It's about 10 a.m. And he says, let's go enjoy a day together. And so these two guys, one of whom we find out is Andrew, uh, the other one presumably is the, is the uh, disciple John, because throughout the book, who's, he's the author, he doesn't reference, reference himself in the story. So whenever the name is left out of who it is, it's often, uh, it turns out it's John. Uh, when, it, when, it, when he can't get around referencing himself, he references himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, and that's in like the, the Last Supper, you know. You, well, I, it's, the story's not about me, it's about Jesus. But oh well, I guess I'll just be the guy that Jesus loved. Anyway, um, so these, uh, so he, he invites uh, Andrew and, and, and perhaps John to come and hang out with, them, uh, with him for the day. And I love that because these guys are probably nervous and a little intimidated. And, you know, they're expecting to probably get a little bit of a, yes, well, follow me for three months and then you can earn enough gold stars on your frequent flyer program to, you know, maybe get the upgraded status and you can get a coffee with me. You know, they're probably expecting what everyone else in the world would give them. But he just opens the door to his life and he says, yes. This is what I want too. What you want with me is the very thing I want with you. I want 
to be in your life, and I want you to be in my life. I want to do life together with you. I don't want an arm's distance. I made you because I love you, and so let's do it. Let's go hang out. And so sure enough, they do. But at some point in the afternoon or morning, we don't know exactly when, but Andrew's like, this is way too cool. I got to go get my brother. And so he hightails it out of there and goes and gets his brother, Peter. Well, it's actually Simon at that, at that point. Goes and gets his brother, Simon, and brings him and says, hey, we found the, uh, the Messiah. And Jesus, as soon as he sees Simon, says, and it, this, it, this word for he looked at Simon is actually very interesting as well. It doesn't have to do, again, with just insight. It has to do with perception. It's like he understood, he looked through. It's like this, you see in your mind's eye. It's the same word that Jesus used later when he says, look at the sparrows uh, and look at the, you know, they neither sow, they know, spin nor, you know, it's, it's this kind of understand something bigger than just the physical reality. And so he looks at Peter. Interestingly, also, it's also the same word that Luke uses when it says that Jesus looked at Peter right when he denied him the third time after the, after the rooster crowed. So it's that same kind of look, that penetrating, insightful sort of a look. He looks at Peter and says, um, you're Simon, but you will be Cephas, which is the Aramaic word for Peter. It may be, they both mean rock. Now, Simon was the most common name in existence at that time in history. That was kind of like the I don't know what the most common name is now, but whatever it is, that was it. You know, the John or the whatever. Maybe it's Peter now, actually. I don't know exactly what the most common names are, but that was, Simon was it. Uh, so, and, and Bar Jonah would be like Johnson, right? So you're like, you're Simon Johnson. You're like the most plain dude in the world. But I'm going to call you uh, Cephas, which actually wasn't a name at all. In Aramaic, it had never been known as a name, and still actually to this day hasn't been known as a name. Right? No one's ever been called Cephas that I'm aware of. We picked up the Greek translation, the Peter, as a name, but Cephas, no, not so much. So it wasn't intended to really be a name. It's more of a title. It's more of a, of a characteristic. It's like Jesus Christ. Christ means Messiah. It means Savior. So we call Jesus Christ because he's Jesus uh, Joshua, in Hebrew, Joshua the Savior, Jesus Christ. So this is Simon the Rock. But he's not saying you are the Rock. <laughs> he's not congratulating Peter for anything. He's actually saying you're Simon. You're kind of ordinary. No offense. But you're going to be a Rock. See, sometimes we get this confused. We think Peter is a rock. He's so stable. Well, not so much. You actually read the story? <laughs> He's all over the map. Woohoo! Woohoo! Woo uh, you know, crash and burn. Up and high, blah, 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 all over the map, right? That's average. That's what you and I do. We're all over the map. But you will be a rock. I love this. So exciting. Oh, one other detail I wanted to, to point out is that it's Andrew who goes and gets him. Now, we don't actually know which of these two brothers was the older one, but we do know that throughout the stories that we're going to read here over the next few weeks, Peter is always listed first. He's the guy who talks first. He's the guy who's listed first. He's the guy who asks questions first. He's the guy who, you know, he's, he is always out front. So we know that their family home was in Bethsaida, a city a, a, a few miles away, and that for whatever reason, uh, Peter and uh, Andrew, Simon, I should say, Simon and Andrew left mom and dad's house and ended up here in wherever they are, Galilee, somewhere. My geography is a little bit off track. Capernaum, I think, is where their house was. Yeah, Capernaum, I, I believe. Don't hold me to that. I'll look it up for next week. Uh, but anyway, older, my guess, now this is total guesswork, but my guess is it's probably Peter's idea. Let's leave mom and dad's house and go start our own fishing business off over closer in this other area that's more at the center of the trade routes. We'll make tons of money, and sure enough, uh, history has it that he had a big house, and they've actually excavated his house. I actually got to see it there. Uh, and so, yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool deal. But anyway, the bottom line is 
Andrew doesn't feature prominently in lots of the stories of the Gospels. He's a relatively behind-the-scenes kind of character. But in this circumstance, I just love it so much that God arranges it so that Andrew is the one who introduces Peter to Jesus. Do you see how this works out? For his whole life, Andrew has been tagging along with Peter. But see, Jesus wants this to be a very unique sort of story. This is not just another I'm tagging along with Peter kind of story. This is a story that's going to blow everybody's minds. And it's going to start with that Andrew was the one to discover Jesus first and then say to Peter, come on. Now, I guess Andrew, in a lot of the stories that were told in their family growing up, might have featured somewhat, been featured somewhat less prominently in the story. And then Peter said, we should do this. And then we went and did that. And it was so great. And how cool is that? Um, and my guess is that Peter might struggle, might have struggled like some of us struggle, just feeling like, again, what do I have to offer? What, where am I at in this story? Do I have anything significant to contribute? Why am I even here? It's really interesting to note how Andrew shows up in the various stories that he appears in in the Gospels. This is one of them. Without Andrew, there would be no Peter in the story. Andrew went and got him and brought him. How cool, right? So for those of us who struggle to feel like, what's my place in this story? Just want to encourage us. There's nothing more significant that we can do than to bring someone to Jesus. Remember the story of the little boy who brought his loaves and fishes and Jesus multiplied and fed the 5,000? You know who found that boy? Andrew. It was Andrew who spotted the boy and said, hey, buddy, you want to bring that stuff to Jesus? I bet he could do something with it. Without Andrew, there wouldn't be a feeding story of the feeding of the 5,000. Without Andrew, there wouldn't be a story of a Peter. Again, it's incredibly significant. Who are you connected to? Who do you see? And really, the most significant thing that you can do with your life, whether people recognize it or not, whether anyone would give you credit or not, whether you yourself would even forget the significance of the moment, you might not even have been realizing how God used you to bring people to Jesus. And yet, this is the most significant thing that we can possibly do, is be used by God to simply be even behind the scenes saying, man, there's this really cool guy named Jesus, you know, can I introduce you? And I'm not talking about like these amazing transformational moments necessarily where someone prays the sinner's prayer. I mean, by all means, may that happen. But just being loving and caring and encouraging and supportive to people in the way that Jesus would do can be an utterly transformational moment in a person's life that really affects the trajectory of the whole storyline of God's uh, redemption in the world. You weren't made as an accident, and your placement at this point in history, being connected to the people that you're connected to, having the relationship with Jesus that you do, and the experiences that you have, and the giftings that you have, is not on accident. And he's designed your life and my life and put us in the perfect place to where there are breakthroughs that cannot and will not happen unless we get out of that mode of saying, I'm nobody and nothing, and begin opening our eyes to say, how? How and where and when can I help people understand more of who Jesus is? And again, just simply helping to bring them to him. There are people who will not come to know Jesus unless you bring them. There are stories that will not end up happening unless you play your part in them. And God is wanting to encourage you and inspire you to say, come on, let's do this thing together. Let's Let me help you get over that fear that says, I don't have any role to play. And let me encourage you that, oh my goodness, you really, really do. So this story was unlike so many of the stories in Peter and Andrew's childhood because, again, God wanted to blow Peter's mind just as much for him to know for the rest of his life and his relationship with his brother to know I never would have found Jesus on my own. For them to have that reality and their, their, their relationship that Jesus was for each of them something so unique that he came to each of them in a way that was so unexpected. Andrew promoting and highlighting Peter and giving him this role of unexpected surprise blessing 
to bring his brother along. What a moment of healing for them in their relationship for each of them to realize and be released from that burden of Peter feeling like he's always dealing with the tag-along brother and for Andrew to feel like, wow, I really have a place of significance. I don't mean to overhype that little detail, but these are the realities that we live in. We stereotype ourselves either into being, well, I'm just so great and everyone just always is tagging along with me and I just feel overburdened by all of it. And Jesus wants to say, Humble yourself. There's only one who is great. And it's me. And I want to use you in great ways. And there are others of us who feel like, well, I never have anything to contribute. And and Jesus wants to say similarly, humble yourself. You're not that pathetic. (laughs) I can still use you. You know, your estimation of how little you have to offer is actually an insult against me. Because I can use you in incredible ways if you would just get over your self-loathing and let me affirm you. Let's move forward in the kingdom and recognize we're all incredibly ordinary per people serving a truly extraordinary God. Amen? Jesus, we love you. We thank you for calling us to this place. Aptos, California, 280 State Park Drive, 95003. With these people at this time, what an amazing thing. We could have been born anywhere at any time with any group of people surrounding us. And yet this is the group of people. And at times it boggles our minds. Who are these people and who am I and what are we doing together? Surely, God, you've made a mistake. (laughs) Because I don't feel like this is adding up to any transformation in my life or in the world. I feel like I'm wasting your time and you're wasting mine. I feel like you have just really missed something, Jesus. And God wants to say, oh no, I know. I know exactly what I'm doing. I designed you. I wove you together in your mother's womb and I've been setting your life up so that you could be part of amazing miracles that, yes, that boggles your mind, but it doesn't boggle your spirit because I put a spirit inside of you that cries out for me and your spirit is crying out for me even now. And if you would turn to me, I would make something of your life that would be beyond anything that you could ask or imagine. So turn to me now. Turn to me in fresh ways. Even as Peter's, we're going to study in the coming weeks, had to keep turning to Jesus again and again and again. No matter how much he learned, he had to keep learning more because Jesus is beyond anything we can ask or imagine. So I just want to speak those words of hope over you. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Be affirmed in Jesus' name. But understand simultaneously that all of that blessing And all of that affirmation begins first with humbling to recognize I'm just an ordinary person serving an extraordinary God. Lift me up and use me, I ask. And when I ask Jesus, you would do that for all of us together as a church family too. In Jesus' name we say, amen. All right, everyone, looking forward to studying more stories in the future. And uh, we'll see you. Go get some dinner. Go get your kids too. Yep, see you. Bye.